Okay, well, welcome. Um, when Bob asked me uh, to present, I thought I would take advantage of an opportunity um, to give a preview and maybe get some feedback and comments uh, for a presentation I'm preparing um, in about mid to late October. I was invited to the Desert Green Conference, which is in Las Vegas. Uh, it's mostly a group of plant growers, landscape architects, landscape contractors, and it's all about bringing green to the desert. Um, and so they wanted to hear about um, how green roofs can work in even environments like that. Um, so I thought what I'd do is just, uh, I get, I'm giving a condensed version of that. Um, I think the talk could be about uh, 30 minutes, maybe 35. Hopefully there'll be some time for questions and discussions after that. Um, so the talk for the presentation in Las Vegas is keeping green roofs cool with biodiverse green roofs in the desert Southwest. Okay, let's see, here we go. All right, so a key concept for this presentation is just the idea that natural habitats are the model for healthy urban ecosystems. Okay, so just like when a person goes to the doctor, you're like, well, doctor, you know, how do I know if I'm sick or healthy? Well, they compare us to a, a normal, healthy human being. So how do you know if an urban environment is in a healthy state? Well, I think we can look at uh, natural areas as that is the condition for that area, right? So you can look at the temperature, you can look at the biodiversity, you can look at the health of a healthy ecosystem. So I'm talking about national parks, state parks, uh, nature preserves that are in high quality condition. Uh, those tell us, you know, how, how are we doing, you know? And I think that has uh, really important implications, not just for park planning in cities, but also for looking at the contribution of buildings with green roofs. So that's the uh, the main concept here. Okay, so in a few weeks, I'll be out in Las Vegas and the map on the left shows the um, natural habitat uh, for that area. Um, it's, it's in the Mojave Desert and that has at the valley floor, it has semi-arid grasslands as the dominant natural vegetation, um, which means it's not just, you know, compared to the Sahara Desert, which is all sand, you know, even though it has less than six inches of rain a year, there is vegetation there and it gets hot for a long period of time. And these plants survive, they've adapted to the microclimates that are there. Um, without any aid from humans, right? So these are tough plants. They've adapted to the, the niche there, the microclimates, and they do quite well. Even with the, a year like this, El Nino, we've had some extremes. Um, you know, there might be some death, but the plants are adapted. They can handle it, right? So to the right, I'm showing some um, coverage of the historic oak savannas um, in, in parts of North America. There's that big green blob down there going up from Mexico through parts of Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, right up into the edge of the Mojave Desert, very close to Las Vegas. Um, so even trees grow in these semi-arid environments at specific locations. Okay, so it might be a certain altitude or maybe in a floodplain or an area where the precipitation is there. Um, so it's just not all void of, um, uh, you know, healthy trees and those kinds of things. Okay, so these plants, obviously they developed and evolved, not by themselves, but all kinds of interactions with biodiversity. Uh, each year in North America, we have about 3.5 billion migratory birds that pass through North America each fall. And these birds are passing through metro areas. Sometimes they, they, they're off the routes, but they're looking for things. They're looking for food. 
place to rest, looking for shelter. And they've been doing this for tens and thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. So how can we build cities that can help create stepping stones or places for things that they're looking for, right? This map on the right uh, showing, you know, Baltimore Oriole, that's one of the migrating birds that passes through North America. And then down below uh, the monarchs, we, those are well known. They move from Mexico up into Canada and back and forth each fall. And they're going right through the heart of Texas every year. Okay, so in order in able to do this, okay, you can't necessarily just drive through the countryside and look out the window and say, oh, that's healthy nature, right? You have to be in a place that has that original vegetation that was there. So I've been working with uh, a few students over the past few years, assembling GIS data and mapping of historic ecosystems, kind of piecing this together. I'm looking at 1492 before the wave of European migrations. And uh, what we see here for College Station, that's that little circle there. 22, that's Oak Savannah, post Oak Savannah. And that 22 is all along the southern uh, seaboard, even up into Georgia, Atlanta, South Carolina, North Carolina. Those were all pine savannas. And today, most of that's been converted to forest. So it's a radical change in the ecosystem there. Okay, and then of course, uh, Las Vegas is in a, a very different kind of ecoregion. That's uh, the creosote uh, plant community. And if you go to the Las Vegas, they have a, a, a biotic web page there with uh, natural vegetation. Um, it's a GIS based uh, website. So I just clicked on one of these uh, navy blue areas here. And it's showing that that creus, that floor, the valley floor there, which is what we're looking at, is the native vegetation is the creosote bush, okay? And then all these different colors of green, those are changes in elevation. And along with that change in elevation is change in temperature, microclimate. So different plant communities. These are like islands of different plant communities living at different locations. Um, and then the city of Las Vegas, you can see kind of in the middle in that pink area, which is urbanized. So this is what that vegetation looks like. It's short uh, stature vegetation, um, you know, grasslands. And the, these plants have adapted here for, you know, at least the past 10,000 years. The interesting thing here is um, places that have extreme climates and challenges often produce endemic plants. These are plants that grow here and nowhere else in the world. So the Mojave Desert has more than 200 endemic plant species in Nevada. Um, and it gets about, you know, 6.2 inches of precipitation uh, a year near Las Vegas. The uh, Mojave Desert in California has at least um, almost 2,500 species of different plants. Okay, and uh, Las Vegas was settled because it does have water, it has some natural springs, wetlands. Um, so uh, all of this stuff I'm showing you here is gonna be important because we'll look at some case studies uh, a little bit later on where people have used plants like these, even in places where there's not a lot of precipitation. Um, I found this nature air, uh, preserve outside of Las Vegas, Sloan Canyon. Uh, if you look at this, you know, these plants are adapted to steep slopes, well-drained soils, and these rocks that are sitting out here, um, you know, on a hot day, they heat up. So it's an amplified growing condition, and these plants have adapted to those environments. And if you compare that with the typical development in Las Vegas, you know, what do we see here? It's kind of the same story. This could be a development on the East Coast, North America. You wouldn't, you know, can hardly tell. Black, dark asphalt pavement, some trees that are struggling to grow in these little uh, planter wells here. Um, and then just conventional roofing. They have a lot of white um, membrane roofing here to try to reduce the urban heat islands. Uh, but I'll, I'll show some examples of that in a little bit of, of what that has to do. Okay, so there's very little indication of any of the natural vegetation here. So if, if, if you're going to develop a site or a project, 
with biodiversity in mind. Um, this, you know, is not intended to be a bioreserve, but it could, if you do something on the rooftops, uh, there are some very biodiverse roofs that are designed for that. Okay, so um, where are the biodiversity hotspots? This is called the Texas Triangle. It's the metro areas between Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, uh, Austin. Okay, there's a hotspot right there, and it's right in the path of suburban sprawl. Las Vegas, it's right in the path of the sprawl is right in the path of a, a biodiversity hotspot. And uh, what about the biodiversity that's there? Well, some of this is uh, imperiled, which means it, it's being threatened by development. So the question is, you know, what can you do? Um, so suburban sprawl is going to happen. Uh, there, there will be buildings there. And sometimes it just it's just impossible to save habitat on the ground because it, there needs to be space for development. So the rooftop becomes a spot where um, you can address these kinds of issues. A quick example here of just you know what kind of those special relationships exist. Um, Denver's kind of in that semi-arid uh, zone. This is Red Rocks Park. Uh, they have this real famous amphitheater there, beautiful uh, setting. However, when I went and visited there, I didn't know that it had a really rich plant diversity. They have over 600 species of plants. And I also learned that some of those plants are hosts to uh, specialist butterflies. A lot of butterflies, not just the monarch, are dependent on individual plant species. So like the lead plant up there, the dog face sulfur and the gray hair streak, uh, these butterflies, they need lead plant. If lead plant goes away, then these insects are going to disappear from this area, right? So it's very critical that we find ways to uh, conserve some of these plant species. All right, so that brings uh, in the idea of the vegetative rooftops, and they're really three different kind of breakdowns. Uh, at the top, uh, showing an intensive green roof, which is really a roof garden. So anything that you can grow on the ground, you can grow with if you have enough soil. Typically more than 12 inches of substrate is there, two to three feet in depth. It's like a lightweight growing media that's designed so it uh, won't compact. It stays uh, stable over time. Uh, it's fairly heavy though, but uh, any any place that's publicly accessible can handle uh, this green roof media, all right? So trees, shrubs, those kinds of things. Um, in the middle is the semi-intensive zone, uh, six to 10 inches depth of growing media. You can support a lot of biodiversity there, uh, forbs, grasses, uh, bulbs, all kinds of plant diversity. Um, when people typically think of a green roof, the extensive green roof, um, that's a really shallow profile, uh, only two to uh, four and a half, five inches depth of growing media. And then the plant media or the plant selection becomes much uh, less extensive um, because not very many plants can survive in a shallow growing media. That shallow growing media heats up. The thinner it is, the shallower it is, the the uh, more heat is transferred down through the growing media. And that means that the roots of the plants are also warm. They don't have that ground connection. Okay, so selecting plants is uh, a real important part of the whole process. All right, a few things on uh, ecosystem services. Um, just to show an example of how sprawl affects uh, natural areas. This is the Denver area. The map on the left showing the daytime surface temperatures, uh, that really bright um, red zone orange up in here, that's all undeveloped land. It's exposed soil. Okay, if you look at night though, it cools off. It's the coolest part of the whole map. And you can see in the city center here, those are buildings. Buildings and pavements, parking lots and those things. Uh, so people have been measuring uh, what are the effects of, uh, you know, building surfaces on rooftops. Well, they accelerate and amplify uh, the air temperatures. 
What you see on the left here is Chicago City Hall, which was a project I was involved with a number of years ago. Uh, those plants are all native to the Chicago region. Uh, so those are tall grass prairie plants growing in six inches of growing media and four inches in other places on there. So the Cook County, which shares the other half of that building, you see the dark uh, waterproofing membrane here. They were asked if they wanted to participate in this uh, urban heat island project for the city of Chicago. They said, no thanks. And uh, actually, it turned out to be a real nice comparison. Um, when people started looking at thermal images of the rooftop, uh, you can see the gradient difference in temperature there during the day. Right, so the green roof section uh, is all coming off as uh, really close to the ambient temperature. And that black roof is uh, highly modified and amplified. So it's heating artificially heating the air in, in the city. So this kind of comes back to the key concept that the natural habitats are really the model for urban, healthy urban ecosystems. So the more we can bring nature into the city, you can bring it back to the, the natural condition that was there. So green roofs can um, prevent urban heat islands through a couple of different methods. Um, obviously, the plants shade the rooftop. If you have a healthy plant community there or a canopy, it's shading the growing media, shading the rooftop. The growing media itself also protects the waterproof membrane. Uh, so that waterproofing doesn't see daylight, right? It's it's all all the solar radiation is being absorbed by the plants. Uh, and if there's moisture moving through the growing media, then you get evapotranspiration. Uh, the more moisture, the more evapotranspiration you get. Uh, but the primary method really is shading. Uh, depending on the height of the building and the size of the building, uh, green roofs can conserve energy by preventing that membrane from heating up, uh, even compared to a white reflective uh, membrane. Um, so obviously a 30 story building is not going to gain as much uh, energy reduction from a green roof as a single story building. But in most cities, you know, the urban, suburban and sprawl are, you know, one or two story buildings, unless you're in a mega city, you know, like Tokyo, where all the buildings are tall and, you know, but regardless, it can, you can still do a lot with, uh, with green roofs. So um, it's a real significant contribution if you look at the uh, reduction, at least 90% reduction of uh, the urban heat island effect. Um, maybe seven, eight years ago, I did a study. Uh, well, more than that, yeah. Um, looking at the temperature gradients on the building I'm in right now, the Langford building. Uh, so we had a conventional membrane, uh, which is what they have on campus. And I've compared that with uh, some green roof modules. So each module had a thermistor um, underneath the module and also at the surface underneath the plant canopy. These green roofs were not watered, um, so they were just growing um, in the natural rainfall because there was no water on the roof at that time. <clears throat> I was the irrigation system. I had to carry water up in five gallon buckets to get the plants established. And that got old real fast. So um, I, I just decided, okay, we're, we're going to do this. So we answered the question, can anything grow on these roofs uh, without irrigation? And fortunately, we found a number of species that will do that. Okay, so this uh, graph to the right here, that orange line, this is the conventional roof. It's the membrane during the day. So you can see at night it cools off quicker than the green roof system, but quite rapidly uh, elevates during the day and then it dies down. Um, if we look at the green roof, the blue color, the B, that's below the growing, uh, the substrate below. So um, the ambient temperature is the red. Uh, so here's the ambient temperature. The green roof underneath uh, does an excellent job of protecting uh, that membrane from heating up. So that's kind of the evidence for uh, reducing the, the, you know, conserving energy and reducing urban heat islands. And uh, it's about a 
uh, reduction in, in the temperature there. Okay, so some of the slides I'm not showing is that uh, the standard plants for green roofs in North America are sedums from Asia, sedums from Europe, from all over the world. Uh, they use them all over on the East Coast. Why? Because, well, that's what people did in Germany. So they're just copying that without any connection to the local ecology. So that's the kind of thing that drove me a little crazy. It's like, well, why are we doing this? There are people that are making green roofs with native plants. And uh, fortunately in the East or the West of North America, those sedums can't survive. They just, they, they fry in the heat, they can't survive it. So people are forced to use the native plants. And uh, I wrote a book uh, kind of capturing the work that those, those people have done here. So I'm gonna highlight a few of those, um, including a couple in the region that I'm in. Uh, so the first snapshot here is looking at uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, the botanist at the Brit Center Botanical Research Institute of Texas told me about this uh, preserved prairie. And so I was quite happy to come here and also saw, hey, there's a great view. You know, why aren't there buildings here? Well, the ground underneath, the bedrock is fractured. It's unstable, so it cannot support buildings. So that's the only reason it's really not developed. And uh, it's just remains as a native uh, prairie, hillside prairie at the top. Um, it's a very biodiverse area, over 600 taxa of plants, uh, which includes hillside prairies, barrens, and wet habitats. Uh, so the person, the scientist that works in this office, she uh, gave me a tour of the green roof there and gave me some of the information that I'm going to show you here. Uh, but the Brit Center, they do research on native plants in Texas. They needed a new office center, so they designed this green roof system. Um, but they didn't model it on the prairie, which is where it says tall grass prairie on the bottom. Um, that is because, you know, those plants at the bottom, they have a ground connection. This green roof is only five inches deep, the substrate, you know. Uh, it's about 12 centimeters. It's not very deep, so you can't grow the same plants. It's also pretty well sloped. So that creates a very different microclimate. Uh, there is water available, but they're very stringent with the water. So they wanted to use a different model to find the plants and that's the prairie barrens. Okay, so prairie barrens is uh, very much like this. Uh, one day, a few years ago, I was hiking out at Inks Lake State Park. And I just stopped on my tracks and I say, this is a barrens. And I said, oh, cool. So I started taking photos and all of a sudden I saw all these plants that I'm like, gosh, look at, there's a prickly bear, there's yucca. These are growing in the rocky areas, right? Uh, so what's important about that? It's exposed rock. This was like a hundred degree day. That rock is heating up and these plants are quite happy there. Irrigation's not needed, you know, uh, they're thriving. If you can see in that little valley where there's grasses and, and the swale, so that's a microclimate for this habitat. So the plants have adapted themselves uh, to that condition. So they designed this roof with that habitat in mind, um, placing prickly pear, kind of its own little plant community, uh, the yuccas and its uh, another plant community and grasses uh, in a different one. Well, inside the building, they have uh, some data collection uh, taking place. I was not able to access what the temperature of their white reflective roof was, but the green roof, and I'm not sure where their temperature sensing is at, uh, was 101 degrees uh, on that day. And I looked up on uh, the NOAA website, it says the high temperature for Dallas-Fort Worth was 96. So I, I'm just guessing that these are miles apart, uh, you know, the location, so I don't know how exact that is. Regardless, it's showing that you know, even with a green roof that, uh, you know, with these kinds of plants, you can get some elevation and temperature up there. Uh, but I'm I'm asking them the question of, you know, I'd love to get that data to, to compare and see what the green roof is compared to the white reflective roof. They said they have the data, but it's, it may not be accessible to the public. All right, so we're gonna jump out to uh, a little further west in the Great Plains, Laramie, Wyoming. Uh, small town, 
kind of in the beginning of the Rocky Mountains, right at the edge of the Great Plains. This was all short grass prairies. And again, um, at the University of Wyoming, the scientists there said, oh, go out to this site and you'll find native plants uh, for green roofs. So we went to this Beta Wu recreation area, gigantic granite slab. It's like uh, one point something billion years old going up to hiking in this area. So I come up to the top and I find this plant blooming, Sedum lanceolatum. Um, it's growing right next to this exposed granite. Uh, something I learned about this plant is that it's been in North America in this location for at least 20,000 years. Even during the ice ages, it survived on these little islands, sky islands, uh, mountains peaking up through the ice. While there was vegetation up there, there was still some habitat in place, even though it's in the middle of an ice age. And this plant developed a unique relationship with this butterfly. Uh, this butterfly is, uh, is dependent on this sedum. Okay, so if the sedum goes uh, you know, extinct, this butterfly will go extinct with it. Um, it's not imperiled at this time, but in, um, it's, you know, it's getting close to kind of a threatened area. Um, and look at that, it's growing right next to this rock. So it's already in amplified condition. So this plant likes the heat, it can take the heat. So just 20 minutes away down in the valley where the University of Wyoming is, I visited their biodiversity center. Uh, they designed this green roof on top of their dinosaur bone collection which is underneath this green roof. And they designed the green roof for based on microclimates, right? So they have three different plant communities, alpine species, foothill species, a valley basin. And look how they designed this green roof, right? So this valley basin is the low point on the roof. Um, these other habitats all drain towards this area. So uh, there's kind of a natural uh, movement of water towards this point. And then the plants they selected here, like irises and other uh, wet plants that grow there. So here's one of the foothill habitats. Um, this is not mounded soil. They have artificial styrofoam underneath that's lifting this, the substrate up. Because as you noticed in the photo, these plants don't grow on a flat roof, right? They, they, they needed the drainage. And that's not exposed soil. That's uh, light colored gravel as a mulch to reflect the heat so it doesn't heat up the soil, the, the substrate. Um, so they're creating this microclimate uh, that's very similar to the natural condition there. Here's the sedum lanceolatum. Uh, it's blooming at the same time as the one up in the, the hills that I saw there. Uh, this roof has, I think, like 119 species growing here, uh, nine native penstemons. I think they're like 13. Uh, Indian paintbrush species. There's there's a lot here. It's a real interesting place. All right, we'll go to some more challenging environments. Desert Southwest, uh, Flagstaff, uh, Phoenix area. I just thought I'd throw this in. Um, I found this historic painting of the Phoenix area, 1926. So here it is today. You can see that same Camelback Mountain. It's just covered with buildings, parking lots, and uh, some palm trees that are not native to the area. Um, so, you know, major change. However, there are some people that are looking at green roofs. So they're not starting with um, four inches of soil. They're starting with 12 inches of substrate. They've already been through the learning curve um, of, you know, how shallow can you go? They said, no, it is a desert, it gets hot. You have to keep those roots cool. So they went with the deeper substrate. And you can see the natural vegetation on the hillside there uh, compared with this building. So looking back the other direction, they have different plots, they're growing things. And they did a study here um, of some little green roof plots to just kind of look at the energy transfer of uh, in this climate here. So number one there is a white reflective membrane. And if you see this graph line of temperatures here, it's um, it's this guy right there. Uh, number two is just the soil. So that's soil with no plants, uh, heats up more than just the white reflective roof. And here's a green roof. They said it was unirrigated. Um, so that is way down here. And this are some of the dynamics of that condition. And here's a white reflective roof with a shade on top. 
uh, number five, which is you know still in this elevated uh, profile there. Um, and then other people are exploring. This is uh, in the the Phoenix Tempe area as well. Uh, Optima uh, mixed use development. So they have irrigation here. They had to do some interesting things. So uh, there are different ways of getting water, and I'll talk about that uh, in a bit. Because yeah, you're in a desert. What about all these plants? Um, New Mexico, Albuquerque, a little bit. Uh, higher in elevation than some of those other places. But this is a project uh, that was put on. Uh, it's a lead rated building, uh, Court of Appeals at the University of New Mexico. The judge, one of the uh, judges there said he wanted a green roof. He wanted to look out his window and see this. And so he was the one responsible for, for getting this going. Uh, four diff 14 different species of plants are native to uh, the valley of Albuquerque there, and they're all uh, arranged or they're irrigated with harvested rainwater. The interesting thing about this roof is the designer took into account the microclimate that the building facade would have on the green roof system itself. So this is a south facing wall. Uh, you can see the angle of this wall is a little bit up, right? If it was facing down, all that heat would be reflected onto the roof. Well, regardless, they put a maintenance path right here of light colored gravel, just because they knew that this zone right in here takes on a lot of heat. So they would just avoid planting that area heavily. Um, so they did that. And this has some native agaves with native grasses mixed in. And I just thought I'd throw in this image, uh, Anza Borrego Desert. Uh, this is like on the other side of San Diego, kind of right into the Mojave Desert area. I visited this roof um, in 2018 as part of the tour. Here you can see a roof vent sticking through and here's the building. So it's the nature center. And this was built in like uh, 1980 something, 79. So this is the oldest green roof in North America. It's still going fine, no leaks. Uh, so that membrane has been protected forever. Uh, they do water it sometimes, but all this vegetation is naturally adapted. Uh, they purposely space the plants be based on water availability uh, in the desert. Okay, so answering the question, uh, what about areas that, you know, have very little water, but, you know, you're going to need to irrigate plants. This project site <clears throat> is in the, the Seattle area, which gets plenty of rain. But the way that they designed this um, building that meets the living building challenge, which means net zero. So they don't, they're not connected to Seattle water. They're not connected to Seattle electricity or sewer. This building is uh, completely off the grid. And the green roof has an important part to play with uh, handling the wastewater. Okay, so they take precipitation uh, from from the rooftop goes into a, a, through a filter. They have potable water, so it is sanitized through a filtering system, chlorine uh, injection. Then the water from the sinks, the showers, and the dishwasher goes into a gray water um, system tank, and uh, from there it goes up to the green roof to deal with the last cleaning of that water, which Essentially, the residual there, by the time it gets to this point in the system, is uh, just looking at phosphorus, nitrogen, those kinds of things. Here's a photo of the basement. You can get a tour if you ever go out there to see this building. Uh, pretty fascinating. So here they're using native wetland plants. Okay, they're growing on a flat roof. And from what I learned, the water's up on this roof for like a week to two weeks is the cycle time going through. And uh, from here, the water leaves the roof to a rain garden down below. And here you can see the at street grade. Um, so they're dealing with all the systems there. Um, at a much larger scale, the city of Vancouver um, made probably the largest meadow uh, green roof in North America. This is the convention center in Vancouver City. Uh, you can see it's a fairly shallow substrate, about six inches of growing media. 
And all these little tubes uh, sitting on these plastic chairs, this is dealing with gray water again from inside the conference center. So people are using the sinks, uh, water draining from the, the kitchens, the sinks, it's all collected and it's up, placed up on the roof. Then the roof is a kind of a mesic meadow. It's all native plants. So even if you could be in a desert environment, uh, like a convention center, a building that has a lot of activity on the inside, all that water could be collected and used for supporting the plants. Okay, so it's really a constructed wet meadow, pre-treated water. Uh, they found 250 species of invertebrates. Okay, it's been up there a while. Uh, some of these, uh, a couple of these are uh, what they thought would be um, extinct, but they haven't seen these insects since the 1950s, but they built this meadow and now these insects are showing up on the roof. Pretty fascinating. Um, okay, so I'll wrap this up here with, you know, the discussion on scale. Cities are large, you know, a large city covers a lot of area. This is San Antonio. Um, on this map on the left, this little green, uh, kind of lime green area, it included all of this area. This is this is the area showing uh, Bear County, which was all Blackland Prairie. So all of San Antonio was built basically in a wide open area. There were very few trees in 1767. Here's the footprint of the city. As you go through the uh, you know 1900s, the 70s, city just expanded uh, concentrically, and it's basically annihilated the whole Blackland Prairie ecoregion. There are just a few fragments left. They're preserved. And look at all these uh, blank rooftops here. So again, the Canadians pull through here with, okay, how are you going to solve this problem? Uh, Olympic Village. Um, I'm sure maybe you've all seen uh, these images. Uh, well, the city of Vancouver has repeated this concept at a couple other places within the city. You know, once you start concentrating uh, green roofs in an area, you can start to make an impact. You know, one green roof in a sea of uh, conventional roofing is not going to do a lot. But if you want to have an impact, policy can drive this. Um, so it's real important to kind of look at scale application, right? Um, so if you take this idea of, you know, green roofs in a multiple blocks, you could actually distribute them systematically across a whole urban area and start to create little habitat islands for, you know, migrating birds, butterflies, whatever, you know, whatever the real biodiversity need is, uh, there could be stepping stones and patches and concentrations of, uh, of green roofs like that. And with that, um, I guess I'll open it up to questions here.